Welcome to episode two of Outside the Spotlight, a podcast dedicated to the female guitarist of our past century and their influence on modern music. I am guitarist, singer-songwriter Diana Chittister, and today we're looking at a woman who may be responsible for cutting the path for all working female musicians. She's a woman who faced down the challenges of working rights surrounding women, especially women of color, just by turning to her guitar and approaching it in a way that would earn her compliments. Compliments such as, she picked the guitar as good as any man I ever heard, or titles like, guitar queen. We travel back to the 1920s to hear how the playing styles of Memphis Mini will influence blues music and blues musicians for decades to come on this week's Outside the Spotlight. Lizzie Douglas began playing music when she was only seven years old. She received a banjo as a gift, but by the age of 11, she traded that banjo for the guitar and went to work performing parties and gatherings right within her community. Now, job prospects at this time were very limited for women and especially women of color. Most jobs were domestic service jobs and farm work. It's not to say that women would be arrested or jailed for working other jobs. But the right to work had not been granted to women yet, and women of color were facing greater issues of segregation. There weren't too many options for women to enter the professional world. However, Beale Street in Memphis, Tennessee was offering something a little different. Something along the lines of integration. On Beale Street, women could work professionally and publicly as performers without question. Therefore, Lizzie Douglas took off from Memphis, Tennessee at the age of 13, and she began finding work playing the bars and the clubs all up and down Beale Street. Initially, work was pretty slow. Most musicians at this time were paid just based off of tips or sometimes just donations of food from business owners. So many sources confirmed that Lizzie Douglas was working as a prostitute to, to sort of supplement her income during these slower times. During these days, prostitution was not illegal. But eventually, her work would begin to pick up and she would be able to start supporting herself solely based off of playing music. Before long, Lizzie Kidd Douglas soon adopted the name Memphis Minnie, and her career as a musician began to grow. Minnie's approach to the guitar referenced the cotton-picking styles that were mentioned in the last podcast. Memphis Minnie laid down a foundation on her guitar riffs utilizing the alternating bass line, and her ability to incorporate blue slide techniques, a new technique, we refer to as double thumbing, and the use of her ring finger sets Memphis Minnie's playing style apart from most. Why the ring finger is so significant is that most blues players in the early 1900s, and even still today, frequently rely mostly on their thumb, index finger, and middle finger. The ring finger being used in Memphis Minnie's playing allowed her to achieve some techniques such as string rolls and some really intricate picking patterns played on a single string, specifically the high E string. We can hear both of these techniques in the song, Crazy Cryin' Blues. The note combination played on the high E strings adds a dynamic intricacy to the song's guitar riff. The picking pattern varies measure to measure, and it's combining note patterns such as triplets and sixteenth notes, and even a few double stops, which are soon going to be popularized by guitar player Jimi Hendrix. Now her string roll 
it sort of mimics a percussion instrument, something that would emphasize a note or a musical phrase. But it's also possible that that string roll may be partly referencing the influence of flamenco or Spanish guitar. Because Memphis Minnie also performed in open tunings. This meant that she rearranged the notes on her guitar to sound like a big open chord. And so many of the open tunings that she used are generically referred to as Spanish tunings. It's because they're rooted in a lot of the Spanish music or Spanish guitar music that we know of. It's possible that Memphis Minnie was exposed to these sort of worldly musical sounds while performing on Beale Street, or even while she herself was on tour with the Ringling Brothers. Memphis Minnie's slide techniques, however, may be her most identifiable characteristic. When Memphis Minnie picked out her guitar riffs, she accompanied them with a lot of slide techniques that almost gave her guitar a voice. She would slide into her notes, allowing listeners to hear all of the sounds and the tones that would connect one half step to the next. In our musical vocabulary, we only recognize whole steps and half step tones. However, when we slide from one note to the next, all the quarter tones and those unrecognized musical sounds are acknowledged. Memphis Minnie also introduced a new technique referred to as double thumbing. This technique allowed her to re-strike a bass string to add some creativity to the alternating bass line used as the foundation of her guitar riffs. You can hear that double thumb technique used in Crazy Cry and Blues as she slides from the low bass string to end a phrase and to lead us back into the next. Memphis Minnie's unique picking style combined with the slide guitar styles of Kansas Joe soon caught the attention of talent scouts from Columbia Records. The scout heard Memphis and Joe performing in a barbershop on Beale Street and offered them the opportunity to record in New York City. Many of the songs recorded by the duo were made popular by mainstream artists covering their music years later. Their music influenced guitarists such as Jimmy Page, who would cover When the Levee Breaks with Led Zeppelin, and Bonnie Raitt, who would go on to pay for Memphis Minnie's headstone years following her death. Memphis Minnie retired from music in 1957, but she never really laid down the guitar. She made appearances on radio to help encourage new, younger blues artists, and she performed a memorial for Big Bill Brunzi, a guitarist that was quoted saying Memphis Minnie could pick a guitar as good as any man he ever knew. After suffering two strokes, Minnie was no longer able to financially survive on just her social security. And that story made its way into a magazine. Readers sent donations and contributions, which helped financially support Memphis Minnie's decision to settle in a nursing home. She passed in 1973 after suffering her third stroke. However, the music and the legacy of Memphis Minnie lives on. She was inducted into the Blues Foundation Hall of Fame in 1980, and her music has been covered and studied by many great musicians, including Jefferson Airplane and even Mazzy Starr. More recently, in 2007, Memphis Minnie was honored with a marker on the Mississippi Blues Trail for her musical contributions and the impact that it had on blues music. As I mentioned, Memphis Minnie's musical journey cut the path for more female performers to follow. Her story began to slow down as musical interests transitioned away from blues and back to folk. Soon, musical genres are going to begin to mix and create all sorts of new categories. But first, the acoustic guitar will have to have a significant transition of its own. That transition will be brought to us by another revolutionary female guitarist. That story is in the next episode of Outside the Spotlight.